And it's always an honor and privilege to be ministering here in this pulpit for my hero. And uh, we love and we honor you, Dad. And we are so blessed to be um, able to carry on ministering the gospel generation to generation. Amen. It's so good. I have a word for you today. I have a word for now, for times like this. And it is going to be a lot of information, but the good news is you can go back and watch it again. I hope you can take out your phone, take notes, but you're going to hear today that God has a plan to overcome every evil attack. All right? So just as the devil has every evil attack prepared, God has the answer for us. Amen. So we're going to jump straight into the word this morning, and we're going to look at one of my favorite passages of Scripture, a simple piece of Scripture, Romans chapter 10, verses 17, that tells us, faith comes by hearing what is told and what is preached. So you need to hear some preaching so that faith is stirred in your life. But it is a specific kind of preaching. It is the preaching of the message concerning Christ. So today you're going to hear a little bit about what the last days and the end times looks like prophetically, but you're going to hear the message in counter to all the uh, the devil's attacks. You're going to hear the counter response, the answer through Christ, that through Christ you'll be able to look into the times, but receiving this message, faith will be stirred, not fear. And so whenever we look at the last days, we must be careful to hear teaching that focuses on the last days and leaves us in fear. Because when we hear the message of Christ, faith is stirred. Wherever you are watching this today, you are going to receive faith. And not faith in yourself, faith in Christ. And faith in Christ moves mountains. Faith in Christ leaves you more than a conqueror. So you are going to have faith Not in yourself, not in your circumstances, not in your abilities, but in your Savior, in His abilities, in His work. So we're going to look at, as a church redemption, we've been unpacking Isaiah chapter 60 this year because I felt in my heart it is a prophetic word for for the church. And I've spoken a little bit about it here in Ramah, but Isaiah chapter 60 verses 1 through 4 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Say, the glory of the Lord rises upon me. Then it says, for behold, darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. Darkness there likens itself over the people to thickness, deep darkness. We don't just have issues in our weather. We don't just have issues in our climate and earthquakes. We are seeing deep issues across humanity. And that word for darkness in Greek is actually likened to chaos and confusion. Nobody knows which way is up. (laughs) Nobody knows what's the answer, what's the solution. But remember, you are not the people. You are the church, the chosen of God. So when deep darkness is on the people, it says in verse two, but the Lord arises over you and his glory is seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Meaning what God does in your life in a time like this, through his hand and his glory, the world is attracted to. That's good news. Because that doesn't mean you walk around defeated. That doesn't mean you walk around suffering like them. You walk around in a different way where it is like the sun is shining on you. Uh, Have you ever flown in a plane and seen a gap as you're either taking off or landing? Maybe there's thick cloudness around, a thick cloud cover, and you, you notice the sun shines through a small gap in the clouds, and there's like a ray of light hitting a patch of earth. That's what you will look like in times like this, like there's the sun on you. People are like, what is happening with this person? They have something I want, why? Because it's good. God's glory is awesome, amen, right? So it even says they come towards you, they're attracted to you, and verse four says, lift up your eyes all around and see. 
We've studied this, and it's interesting. It says, look up in the, Greek, in the Hebrew, look up, and then it says, now look down and look again. Meaning, see the natural circumstance through the revelation that is first coming from looking up, looking to Jesus. So when we look today at who Jesus is and the work he is doing and the work he has done, we look back down around our circumstances and we don't see obstacles, we see opportunities. We don't see darkness, we see we will possess light. Amen. Right? You don't have fa a fear now, now you move into a faith space. My God is with me, my God is working. So, do you know that the devil has functioned in the same way as God has? From when humanity is on the earth, we've noticed the devil has the same strategy, the same pattern, and the same plan. And when we read our Bible, we see amazing things. Can I just say this? When you look into Scripture to see Jesus, it blows your mind. Today, as I move, I'm going to move a bit quick, but you're going to see Jesus was not plan B. It's always been about Christ. So we're going to go back into the Old Testament to a story where the devil, through, you know that the, the people are not evil, they function from an evil spirit. They are being puppets, right? So we'll see this pattern of how evil moves on the earth, and the same way evil moves, how do we know God moves through people? You are God's chosen. He's going to use you to show his glory and his light. So the nation of Israel are moving through the desert and they keep conquering enemies, enemy after enemy. And the word gets out that there is this people that are just unstoppable. And a king who is scared about this, his name is Balak, and he knows that he could be next. So he comes up with a plan and he says, I'm going to summon a great, powerful person who is able to curse people. And the moment he curses people, they remain cursed. This person's name is Balaam. And so Balaam calls Balaam and he says, I'm going to give you riches, but you need to go and find this nation of Israel where they are, and at the time, they were still in the desert. They were not even yet in the promised land. And as they're camped out in the desert, he says, go find them and curse them, destroy them, stop them. And you know that the devil still functions this way. However we look at our life, his goal is to kill, steal, and destroy, to come against people to bring their life into misery, to bring destruction. And even more so, the day you said, I believe in Jesus and I'm gonna be a part of his bride and his church, the devil said, now you're not just neutral, now you're on the offense, you are against me. You're a problem to me. But I wanna tell you that the devil cannot curse what God has blessed. From scripture. All right, so. This guy Balaam decides, I'm going to go curse the nation of Israel. And he starts, on his quest to curse Israel, he starts to run into a problem called the Lord. <laughs> and the Lord deals with him. And even in Numbers chapter 22, verses 12, God says to Balaam, you shall not go with them and you shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So in Numbers chapter 23, verses 7, we have this interesting moment where King Balak is standing with Balaam on a high place. So the nation of Israel is camped out in the plains, in the valleys, and King Balak with Balaam is perched high on a corner. Now, if you look at this exchange and you study it out, you'll see this happens time and time again, but they go from corner to corner, from all four corners they go to pronounce a curse, but something happens. Balak stands up and he's about to pronounce a curse in verse 7. Uh, uh, Balak says, the king of Moab says, I brought from, uh, has brought me from Aram. And Balaam says, from the mountains of the east, come curse Jacob for me and come denounce Israel. And this is his response in verse 9. How should I curse 
that which God has not cursed. How shall I denounce whom the Lord, see Jesus is involved, everyone, has not denounced. From the top of the rocks, I see him. Not them, him. And from the hills I behold him, not them. He sees a person. He sees the Lord. In verse 11, Balak says to Balaam, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and look, you have blessed them bountifully. <laughs> You've blessed them. He says in his response, must I not take heed to the speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? God gave him words over him. And he didn't see a people, he saw a person. Now what's interesting is in Numbers chapter 2, God spoke to Moses and he said, order your people to camp in a certain way. Now, when you camp naturally in a wilderness, I don't know if any of you have watched like movies about, I don't know, cowboys, but when you are exposed from all sides, you circle your wagons. You camp in a circle facing out so that from a 360 degree view, you get to see the enemy's attack. That makes sense, right? That, that's how you should camp if you're going to be under attack. But in Numbers chapter two, God speaks to Moses to order the nation of Israel to camp in a specific pattern. In fact, he even orders them to go tribe by tribe and he orders them out from the tabernacle. So first we set up the tabernacle of worship, the house of worship, and from there, he starts to order tribe after tribe in the direction of east, south, west, and north. North, east, south, and west. He doesn't order them to camp in a circle. So when Balaam stands up and he decides, I'm going to curse them, and what does he say? I see him. Do you want to know what that looked like from space? We're going to pull up a picture for you to see of what Balak and Balaam saw in the desert. <laughs> Come on, do you see it? It's a cross. It's a cross. And what does he say? I see him, the Lord. Now, when you're camped out, we're talking about millions of people. Camping doesn't lead to blessing. Camping is not, is not doing things for God. Have you ever been camping? It's just you're chilling out. You're making a braai. You're relaxing. You're seated. The kids are playing. However, God did give Moses instruction, and he told him to tell the people to face the tabernacle. They were not to be camped facing out where the enemy would attack. They were to be camped facing the temple. God wants your eyes not on what the devil is doing, but on what the Lord is doing. God wants you to wake up in the morning and feed your faith looking at what Jesus is doing. Do you wanna know what's even more awesome is if you look at the layout of the tabernacle, do you know there was all these things, like on the outside, we have the bronze altar. Then you have the prayer labor where you would wash your hands. Then you would move into uh, the, the inner courts. And in the inner courts, you would find yourself finding the table of showbread and the candle, uh, the lampstand. And then you find yourself with um, another altar. And then you would go through into the Holy of Holies. And there you would find the Ark of the Covenant. Do you know what shape the tabernacle was laid out in? Let's pull up the picture. The shape of the tabernacle was what? At the very center of worship, God wants you to see him. And the most holy place in the tabernacle was what? The holy of holies, which is where what? The blood of the sacrificial animal is sprinkled. It's the work of Jesus on the cross. At the very center is his work. And God wants your eyes on what he has done and is doing for you. Okay? 
So we're going to keep moving. And what's interesting is in this layout of north, east, south, and west, God tells Moses, I want certain tribes to be facing the direction of the enemy. So the tribes on the outskirts that would encounter the attack. So to the north, God says, I want the tribe of Dan. And he says to the east, the tribe of Judah. To the south, the tribe of Reuben. And to the west, the tribe of Ephraim. And do you know that each tribe has a banner? On this banner, this big banner, the tribe has its name and it has an image. It has a picture. So the tribe of Dan's image is an eagle that's facing north. To the east, the tribe of Judah has a lion. To the south, the tribe of Reuben has a man. And to the west, the tribe of Ephraim has an ox. Four tribes, four banners, facing out for all four directions with four pictures. We see this prophetically speaking of the work of God. The, the picture of God in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 10 says, it literally speaks of these faces in a prophetic picture, their likeness. Each had the face of a man, face of a lion, face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. In Revelations, it tells us around the throne of God. Revelation chapter 4 verses 6 through 7, before the throne was a sea of glass, and in the midst of the throne, around the throne, were four living creatures, full of eyes in the front and back. Now, Revelations is an amazing book. But if you were to try to describe to people what the supernatural looks like, you use natural expression. So this is not a beast with a million eyes. It's an all-seeing being. How do you describe an all-seeing being? You say it has eyes everywhere. It sees all. It's a 360-degree view. It's the full picture, right? In verse, look here. So then it says in verse 7, the first living creature was that like a lion. The second living creature was that like a calf. The third living creature has a face like a man. This is a well-taught church, eh? The fourth living creature was that like a eagle. It's very interesting. So we see how four faces, four banners, four tribes, right? What, what is the point of this? Well, do you know also it tells us in Revelations how the devil attacks it even describes how literally what the end will literally look like, what the end times will look like. And it gives us four horsemen called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It's okay. My preaching doesn't entertain everybody. <laughs> I'd also be more interested in playing with my friends in kids' church. But listen to this now. When we think about it, Although it's not the apocalypse yet, all right? No need to fear it. How many of you have recognized the devil functions the same way? So the four horsemen, it, it's not just for the apocalypse. We see there's four ways the devil attacks. So in Revelations chapter 6, it tells us of four horses released to attack from four different directions. The first horse, as they open the seal, Right in verse 2, Revelation chapter 6, verses 2, is a white horse. On it has a crown, like the rider has a crown and a bow and arrow. And it is out to conquer. Now, what's interesting is this horse is a white horse. Now, we know when Jesus returns, how does he come? Like a king on a white horse. This horse is out to attack truth. Not just what is true, but what is the truth. Christ is the king of kings. His work is the ultimate work. 
His word is the final word. Not the opinions of man, but what does Jesus say? What does the word mean? What does it, that work mean? What is truth? What is true? I am the way, the truth, the life. So this comes as a fake truth. You could even call it fake news. Its job is to bring chaos and confusion. Never before have people not known what is true. I found this on the internet. This was said by a politician. Politician changes their mind the next day. Come on, no one knows what's real. No one knows what's true. In fact, now we have something called my truth. Right? It's my truth. It's my truth. I don't believe in gravity. That's my truth. If I jump off a building, the truth will determine my truth was a lie. <laughs> the second horse mentioned is a red horse. In verse 4, and it is sent out that people should kill one another in war and strife. The third horse is a pale horse. Sorry, the, the third horse is actually a black horse. And this black horse attacks, and it has a purpose, to literally rob of all and bring great famine. And the fourth horse is a pale horse. It says here, with it comes death by the beasts of the earth. But that word there for beasts in Greek is small plague, tiny virus. There are four horses that attack. One that confuses us what is truth. The second that causes us to turn one against the other. The red horse, come on now. We are more divided as a people on the earth now more than ever. We thought we were in strife over race, over gender, but now we're in strife over vaccinations. Now we're over strife over which political party you're a part of. Now we're over strife over anything. Destroying our lives, destroying our communities, destroying our marriages, our homes our families. The red horse has never been more active. What else do we find? Famine, the black horse. This black horse comes to impoverish, comes to rob. It even, it even comes to restrict. It's not just poverty, it is the pressure poverty brings with it. And the last horse is that of disease, the pale horse, which comes to bring the beasts, and the word therefore beasts is viruses upon the earth. Variants upon variants. Not only has COVID brought death, think of everything else that has taken place around it. In my lifetime, there has never been more death on the earth than now. So we have the four horses that come to kill, steal, and destroy. But God says, arise and shine, for your light has come. Pastor, this is, this is pretty Old Testament. How does Jesus get involved in, in all of this? Well, in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 7, Jesus starts to talk about the last days and prophetic picture. He first describes that the temple that he was busy talking about and talking from would be torn apart and no stone would be left unturned. And that happened a few decades after Christ's ascension into heaven. Then he goes on and he starts to describe in verse 3, the disciples say to him, tell us... When will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming? And at the end of the age, Jesus answers them in verse 4, Take heed that no one deceives you. What is the first horse? The white horse, fake news, fake truth, deception. For many will come in my name. You know, in the name of Jesus, I declare something the opposite of Scripture. Come on now. False prophets, <laughs> out to just rob people and take things for themselves. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Verse 6, and you will hear of 
wars and rumors of wars, the second horse sent out is strife, the red horse. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, the red horse. Come on now, what's going on? Russia, Ukraine, all the nations now picking sides, preparing for the implications thereof. It's not natural, it's prophetic. But we don't live in fear. And I'm going to show you why. So what's the next horse that is released? He says in verse 7, and there will be famines. The black horse, out to bring poverty on the earth completely. And what's the last thing Jesus says? And there will be pestilences. What's that? Viruses and disease and earthquakes in various places. Jesus says this will be the sign of the times of my coming. Now you have four horses, but you also have four banners. And the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, I will raise up a banner. That word for standard is a banner, right? So what were those four tribes? Dan, Judah, man, uh, Dan, Judah, Reuben, and Ephraim. Dan is the eagle. Now, do you know what else we have four of in Scripture? The four Gospels. What's their order? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Interesting. Matthew speaks of Jesus as king. No record of his humanity. The king of kings, the lord of lords. It's all about the genealogy of Jesus from David. The king of kings. What was the banner of the tribe of Judah? The lion. What were the four faces around the throne of God? That see all. Lion, eagle, ox, and man. Four gospels, four faces. Huh. The eagle speaks of a height, seeing all from heaven. The book of John speaks of the deity of Jesus. How Jesus functions as God. That he is God. In the beginning was the word. It's, it's, let's not even talk about other things. Let's just focus on Jesus is from heaven as God. To the south, we had the tribe of Reuben, which was literally the picture of a man. What do we have there? Luke. Luke says, the son of man, the son of man, the son of man, the son of man. The humanity of Jesus. And what's the last book we're talking about? Mark. And what does Mark speak of? The work of Jesus. Speaking of our ox. Speaking of his work for us. So we have four horses that come to attack. The white horse comes from the east. And what is it met with? The banner of Judah. Fake news is met with the ultimate truth. Jesus. Right? <laughs> to the north, we have the pale horse attacking in Scripture. The pale horse bringing disease and famine. What does it meet? The tribe of Dan, the picture of the eagle, which is what Jesus is God. In fact, in John, it emphasizes Lazarus' resurrection, dead four days, speaking of the healing power of Jesus. So what the pale horse meets with its viruses, Jesus comes with supernatural healing. From the south, we have what? The black horse, which comes with famine. It meets Luke, the son of man. And it's interesting that even at the cross, they gamble at the south of the cross for Jesus' garments. It speaks of Jesus literally our supernatural provider, our working for our provision in the midst of famine. And what do we have? That We have the red horse attacking from the west, and it comes against the tribe of Ephraim, the work of Jesus as our ox. Now, the ox, oxen. It is not just the work of Jesus for our provision. What is the ultimate work of Jesus? 
is that what? He died for us, that he shed his blood. And when we look at that work, there is something supernatural that happens because it starts to deal with strife. Are you with me so far? Okay. So now I want to take you on this journey because it sounds like Jesus is talking about these things. And we have, the four, we have the four horses, and we have the four banners, and we have the four north, south, east, and west, the four corners looking at the cross. But how is that relevant to today, Pastor? Well, in Acts chapter 2, the church is born. You are born. And in that sermon, it is so interesting that it is mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verses 24, God raised Jesus up. Now that first sermon is preached to mainly Jews. So they understand when it says God raises someone up, it means he's lifted high. Now he was raised on a cross in front of them. And as Jesus was raised, it says, what does he do? He loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. It starts to describe Jesus in a way that you would have understood in his work because they understood if that banner was raised, they didn't need to face the direction from which the attack came. As long as the banner and the face and the work of God faced the horse and the attack, they, the people, could camp in rest facing the tabernacle. Okay? So now they hear Jesus was raised. Now, everyone there is going, yes, we remember he was raised up on a cross before us. You know, when the Bible says, raise Jesus up, lift him higher, we sing that song, lift him higher for the world to see, he will draw all men unto himself. Do you know the original scripture there doesn't speak mainly of men coming. Now, we know people come in response to Christ, but it speaks that when Jesus was raised up, all that man had was put on him. So it says, as we raise him up, our sin, our sickness, our famine, our strife, our confusion is imputed onto him. He drew all onto himself. When you see him raised up, you see my solution is here. My provision is here. My healing is here. So in the sermon, as it's preached, People respond by the thousands and they get baptized and the church is born. And it tells us later on in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, the early church continued steadfast in four things. What were the four things? First, verse 42, they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. What is the apostles' doctrine? The gospel concerning Christ, the finished work, the gospel of grace, the revelation of your righteousness through Christ's death and resurrection. This is what the apostles preached. So the first thing they focused on as the early church was what? The gospel of Jesus Christ through scripture. And what's the first horse that approaches? the one that attacks Jesus as king. So your answer to confusion is truth, and truth is the word of God concerning Christ. Like we saw in Numbers, it wasn't about camping, it was about the picture that you rest in Jesus and the cross, and your eye is on the worship of Jesus and his work. And with your banners raised, the four faces, meaning the four works of Jesus, you can rest knowing that every attack of the enemy blesses you doesn't just curse you. When they stood up to bless, they ended up cursing. That's why in Romans chapter 8, he says, all things, not all good things, all things, meaning all the attacks of the enemy work together for my good. Right? So we see in the world today, the four horses cooperating, but we have to recognize that the four faces of Jesus are working. So the first one was to deal with the white horse, that fake king, fake truth, false news is handled by the apostles' doctrine, like you're hearing today. You are provided for, not because you stay awake at night. You are healed, not because you have the cure for anything. You are, you are at peace, and you are able to forgive, not because you're good at forgiving, but because of what is required of us in this time, Christ has provided. 
Christ does the work. He rises and his glory is seen upon us. What's the second thing the early church continues steadfast in? Fellowship. What's the answer to the red horse? We're looking at it. Multicultural, multi-generational. Church of Jesus Christ. Jew and Gentile worshiping together one savior. We don't see people as as, as not good enough, not accepted, not welcome. We see them as we are one family in Christ Jesus. We model to the world what true unity looks like amidst diversity. So the second horse, the red horse, is dealt with as we fellowship around the doctrine of the apostles. When we fellowship around the doctrine of the apostles, what's the third thing they are doing together? The breaking of bread. What is that? Receiving of the communion. What is this dealing with? This is dealing with the fact that in Christ we are healed and whole. In Christ we are healed of all our disease. Right? That pale horse that comes to make us sick, we declare by his stripes we are healed. Amen. Amen. And it says, and they continued in prayers. And that word for prayers is not empty prayers. It's open heaven prayers. What is that? Tongues. Right? Tongues. Tongues addresses when I don't know what to pray. I pray by the Spirit. I speak the Word of God. I address a situation beyond my natural ability. I bring life into a dead situation. I bring peace into chaos. Right? That's awesome. And you know what else they did? They were generous with their goods. So we see how they pray in tongues and they're generous with their giving. They have a revelation of the supply of God financially. What is that addressing? The black horse of famine. God doesn't want you to give to rob you. God wants you to be generous so he can make you a channel of blessing, a resource in a time like this. You walk into your job and you're thriving, not because you're up all night, but because God is blessing you. The people in your work literally practically say, what is this happening in your life? Is the glory of the Lord. Working in a time like this, where inflation is. You, do you see that the early church functioned in the four things that deal with the four faces of Jesus that are literally destroying the four attacks of the enemy? Aren't you glad to be in church today? Aren't you glad to be in the body of Christ today? Jesus is the answer to every single attack of the enemy. And as you recognize the nation of Israel were camped, you might be sitting there going, wow, that's a lot of horses, pastor, that's a lot of attacks. Recognize the nation of Israel were told, rest, camp, and face the tabernacle. You rest, meaning you cease from trying to fight these horses in your own strength. And you rest at the feet of Jesus, your eye on the church, your eye on what God is sharing, your eye on the word. Listen, we were hearing about sharing our faith today. How easy is it to say to someone, you see what's going on in the news? Listen to this word. I know what your answer is. Listen to this sermon talking about wars and pestilences. and it, But your answer is Jesus. It's so easy to go, my goodness, pastor, in a time like this, Jesus works, and the Bible doesn't say just works to fend off the attack. It literally says the attacks end up being used together for good to bless you. Every attack of the enemy that meets Jesus is for your good. <laughs> Lazarus may have died, and a few people knew who he was. But when he was raised from the dead, everybody knew who he was. Everybody wanted to say, what happened in your life? I was dead and someone called Jesus showed up. This is how God is going to use you in a time like this for his glory. 
So when we wake up and we hear this on the news, that on the news, this truth, that this, strife, issues, where do you stand on this issue? Where do you stand on that issue? We got to get a revelation of being steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, steadfast in gathering as the church, steadfast in receiving communion together, steadfast in an open heaven prayer, and steadfast in our financial faith in God. And as we do those things, we camp, we rest, and every single attack is turned for your good in Jesus name I want to pray over everyone before I hand back to the local pastors in other churches Father God today we lift up that banner of Jesus when the enemy comes in like a flood we have a banner that will be raised against every attack and today I declare over each person that they are loosed from this burden of this earth, loosed from fear, loosed from fearing what is gonna happen next and released into faith that Jesus is gonna work this out, that the glory of God is gonna rise on the church of Jesus Christ. And we will be a testimony that our God is alive. Arise and shine, bride of Christ, for your light has come. We declare that even today, broken relationships are restored, Lord God. People are brought into the light that they will see the way out by the work of Jesus. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're gonna walk in a supernatural way in the midst of natural chaos and darkness. We believe it, we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you so much for watching today's Word. I know you were blessed greatly and I want to let you know if you want more resource like this, more sermons like this, they're all available for free on YouTube or on our Redemption Church app. So I want to encourage you, if it blessed you, share this link with someone else and ensure that you get more of God's goodness and Word in you. We are so excited that Redemption Church has been able to serve you with the good news of Jesus Christ today and look forward to seeing you return for more of God's goodness as we preach the word of Jesus. Be blessed.